Good morning and welcome to Pilgrim Congregational Church, United Church of Christ here in Oak Park, Illinois. My name is Reverend Gloria Cox and I am the Associate Pastor and we are so happy that you have chosen to join us on this 4th of July Sunday. We hope that you're enjoying a happy, safe, and healthy holiday weekend. And we are also very, very happy to welcome our guest preacher this morning, Reverend Harriet Dart. We are a multicultural, multiracial, and open and affirming congregation, welcoming to all and believing that our ongoing journey to seek understand and answer God's call is enriched by the diversity and strength that we find in community. Thank you for joining us on our journey today. Good morning, I'm Nancy Miller, and I'm your liturgist this morning. I welcome you to worship at Pilgrim Congregational United Church of Christ Church. Please join in the call to worship. Settle into your seat, close your eyes, and imagine a place that brings you comfort and peace. Breathe in the goodness of that space Breathe forth the goodness that is within you as we prepare to worship our God. And now please join me in the opening prayer. Gracious and loving creator, we gather as a blessed people, a loved and loving church family, united in this worship yet separated worshiping online in our separate homes. Draw us together. Draw us close to you and close to one another in caring love. Touch our hearts and make us whole. Amen. Now let us join together in singing the opening hymn, how firm a foundation, and we'll be singing stanzas one, four, and five.
Each week, as we worship together, we have the opportunity to admit to ourselves, to each other, and to God that we do not always live as we are called. In this time of confession, this time of opening our hearts, let us remember that God is merciful and just, eager to offer grace and love. Please pray with me. Puzzling God, we hear in the gospel message that Jesus was questioned and rejected by his own hometown, friends, and relatives. And we wonder how he was able to continue in ministry with such a lack of support. We want to enter our endeavors with full support and acclamation. We are afraid to begin a task if even our families, friends, and hometown folk belittle it and also us. So rather than face degradation, opposition, or conflict, we back down. Forgive our lack of faith and vision. Empower us to be in service to you, even when we do not feel the support of our family. Let us trust in your power and presence with us. Heal us. Guide our lives and our journeys all our days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, do not be afraid of criticism or taunting of others. Place your trust in God's call and guidance. Know that the Lord is always with us, even to the ends of the earth. Amen. From Edwards Congregational United Church of Christ here in Davenport, Iowa, the whole Gaston family and the Olson family wish you all peace. Be with you, Pilgrim, from the Tysons. Peace of Christ, from the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, Cades Cove. The Old Testament reading this morning comes from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. He said to me, O mortal, stand up on your feet, and I will speak to you. And when he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. And I heard him speaking to me. He said to me, Mortal, I am sending you to the people of Israel, to a nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants are impudent and stubborn. I am sending you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they shall know that there has been a prophet among them. And you, O oh mortal, do not be afraid of them, and do not be afraid of their words. Through Though briars and thorns surround you, and you live among scorpions, do not be afraid of their words, and do not be dismayed at their looks, for they are a rebellious house. You shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning and welcome to all God's children. So this morning I brought two different kinds of drink containers. You know, they're a special kind 
that you can travel or bring somewhere, maybe out to the park or in the car. And it has a special opening, doesn't it, to keep it in there. So you can either drink it out of that way, or you can take the lid off and you can drink it this way. So it has two ways to be able to use it. Do you think there's two ways to fill it? Do you think you could fill it through here or fill it while it was open? And which way do you think would work the best? Well, let's do a little experiment. I'm gonna leave this one open and I'm gonna leave this one with the lid on. And let's see which one fills up more. All right, well, that one filled all the way to the top. Can you see there might be a problem here with the one with the lid? Let's see what we have. So this one here filled all the way up to the top. But the one with the lid on, I did get some in there, but just not as much as I got in there. Well, it's similar to our scripture today. Let's imagine that the one with the lid closed is the hometown that Jesus went to today in our scripture to preach. The people there were not very open or excited that Jesus was there to tell them about God's love, hope, and blessing and healing because they weren't sure if he was some really truly the son of God or just that boy that they knew from playing in their village. But later in the scripture, Jesus sends the 12 disciples out to all the surrounding villages to tell about God's love, God's hope, God's blessing, and God's healing. But they were all open, more like this cup with the lid off. Which one do you think was able to get more of God's love and blessing? Well, the one with the lid off, of course. Now, we choose, both were villages and towns pretty much the same, but they chose to be open or closed. Just like we have the choice to be open or closed to taking in all that God has to give us. Now, I feel very blessed to be at Pilgrim, and each and every Sunday, I feel like we are open to God's love, open to God's blessing, open to God's hope, and we're not keeping our lid closed. So which are you, open or closed? Let us pray. Dear God, help us to be open, not closed up and keeping your love, your blessing, your hope, and your healing away from us. Let us be that open vessel. Amen. This morning's gospel reading comes from the sixth chapter of Mark, verses 1 through 13. The rejection of Jesus in Nazareth and the calling of the twelve. He left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man come from? Get all this. What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and Joseph, the brother of James and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And Jesus could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out, two by two, and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. 
He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed them with oil, many who were sick and cured. He cured them. Please pray with me. Wondrous God, empty me. Empty me so that your spirit might fill me and that I might reveal your word and not obscure it. Bless each of us as we hear these words, that we might hear them and take them into our heart and see what our hands are left to do. Amen. Like many of you, I'm exhausted by the last few years of political contentiousness and the shenanigans of elected politicos. This weekend, we hear scripture that has no explicit political interest. At least I don't think so. This morning's gospel depicts Jesus' trouble with his family, and he commissions and sends out the disciples. No obvious politics of the right or the left are there. But it's July 4th, the day we celebrate our national independence, when a group of talented community organizers the so-called Founding Fathers, gathered and took the risk of signing on as witnesses to separate themselves from a world power. The Declaration of Independence resembles the format of a resolution of witness that is presented to the UCC General Synod. And next week, delegates to General Synod 33 will be virtually gathered for the United Church of Christ and consider 10 different resolutions of witness. Members of local churches come together every other year to give witness to their faith and vote on formal resolutions of witness, which concern a moral, ethical, or religious matter confronting the church, the nation, or our world. The Declaration of Independence was only the first step to birthing a new nation, the actual founding of the New Republic took another 13 years and began with this bold vision as its foundation. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, and promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. The Constitution acted like a colossal merger contract, uniting a group of states with different interests, different laws, and very different cultures. Under America's first national government, the Articles of Confederation, the states acted together only for specific purposes. The Constitution united its citizens as members of a whole, vesting the power into the union of its people. Without this, the American experiment might have ended as quickly as it had begun. We often give thanks for the blessings of this democracy during Fourth of July celebrations. But the COVID panic has provided a time to step back to take a more authentic look at our country's history. It's not all pretty, for sure, and reflects the compromises needed to satisfy the men who held power and property at the time of its founding. And so today, we are asking, how can we be a better people? What might our nation do to be a true democracy with blessings for all, where everyone gets to come to the table? where everyone's voice is heard. How can we live up to the vision of our founders on this day and every day, but on this day particularly when we celebrate the independence as a country? Another look at our Gospels provides some insight. 
It appears that Jesus has been rejected by his home synagogue and members of his family. This is Mark's short version. But Luke chapter 4 gives more details of his first sermon, which foreshadows the preamble to our own United States Constitution. From Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 20, when he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he, began, he said, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Looks a little more dramatic. They run him out of town. And so though Jesus and Mark has been attracting many crowds, they also suddenly turn against him. Perhaps that is one reason Jesus calls a small group of ordinary people and commissions them to be his disciples. He sends them forth to do the work that he has been doing. He sends them out as pairs. They don't go alone. So the disciples went out and proclaimed that people should change their hearts and their lives. Jesus has burst forth on the scene preaching that God's realm is coming near. He's gone head to head with the powers that be, religious, government, and demonic. And now Jesus turns to these 12 ordinary people and sends them out into the world to do the very same things that he has been doing. He sends them out to proclaim God's word and to, to encourage people to transform living. You know, this is a very remarkable moment in the Gospel of Mark. Mark's Gospel begins with an introduction of Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah. With an opening acclamation like that, we expect some amazing signs and wonders. And we get them. But did we expect that this same Messiah would then turn around and delegate his messianic, transformative work to a group of ordinary people? And by the way, in Mark's Gospels, these disciples are very, very ordinary, as Gloria led us through Bible study last winter. They misunderstood Jesus from the very first. They never seemed to get the point of the teaching. They remain clueless, stumbling along after Jesus, all the way to the end of the gospel. Mark seems to go out of his way to demonstrate that for whatever reason, they were chosen to be the disciples. It's not because of their abundant gifts and talents. It's because of their very humanity. Now maybe you think that God is omnipotent, omniscient, and can do anything God wants, all by God's self. But God doesn't work solo. As our UCC statement of faith so eloquently states, in the man of Nazareth, you have come to us and shared our common lot. God needs witnesses who will take action. God comes to us in Jesus Christ and calls ordinary people to work with him. Jesus, the great delegator, the Savior who chooses not to save the world by himself. Jesus sends these ordinary people out to do the very same things that he has been doing, and he calls them to witness. In today's gospel, Jesus calls, commissions, and ordains people like you and me to proclaim this good news. Had any of the disciples taken previous medical training? I doubt it. And yet they are sent out to do miraculous healing work. What a way to inaugurate the realm of God. And that is uniquely the way Jesus does things. When I accepted the invitation to give the message today, I began listening to Hamilton, since it's now available on stream. Wanting to understand the story better, I went to the library to get its libretto. 
found a wonderful book which contains Lynn manuel Miranda's footnotes, production details, and at the very end, an epilogue from the night when former President Obama came on stage to speak after the curtain call. President Obama speaks to the audience at his political fundraiser, quote, part of what's so powerful about this performance is it reminds us of the vital, crazy, kinetic energy that's at the heart of America, that people who have a vision and a set of ideals can change the world. Every single step of the progress that we've made has been based on this notion that people can come together and ideas can move like electricity through them and the world can change." End quote. COVID has taught us new ways to come together. And unlike Ezekiel, your voice will be heard in the halls of power. You can be a virtual witness from the comfort of your own home, in your pajamas, in front of your computer. In Illinois, witness slips can be submitted for a bill before it is considered by a committee in either the State House or the State Senate. Submitting a witness slip allows your voice and your opinion to be presented directly to all members of a committee as they determine whether a bill will go to a full floor vote. Back to Hamilton. The music captures our imagination like the young rascals who broke away from England. But Hamilton also sings itself into our hearts as the keeper of the flame. Obama reminded the audience of the primary message of his presidency, the need to keep hoping and to work together. But an important aspect that Hamilton will carry into its future isn't a specific message. It's the underlying belief in stories and their power to change the world Jesus taught his disciples with parables and his story and the story of the 12 that followed him and those that joined him expanded across the Roman Empire and still inspires us today. Stories can be an engine for empathy and a way to show people what they share. Stories can connect us and provide a bridge across the polarizations that we find today. When we share our stories, when we hear and when we believe, the kaleidoscope that is America can understand herself a little bit more and rediscover our common shared values. The play Hamilton is the story of America then, but it's told by America now. Rather than telling the people of color's story during the Revolutionary War, Miranda's instead chose to correlate the struggles of the founding war, of the Revolutionary War, and the founding fathers then to the diverse America now. Through our own dedication and determination, we have a chance to improve our nation and leave behind a legacy good for our children. People of all colors, genders, sexualities, races, nationalities, and abilities have an opportunity I have an opportunity to rise up and create a better world. And that is a message we so desperately need in our time. Amen. In Franco Zeffirelli's film about Francis of Assisi, Brother Sun, Sister Moon, there's a scene in which the townspeople bring their gifts to the poor but lovingly rebuilt church of San Damiano, while the powerful people sit morosely in their majestic cathedral in Assisi. The people who have followed Francis beyond the edges of town bring simple gifts of flowers, vegetables, and lambs, and it's clear that they represent those on the edges of society, welcomed and loved in their new church home. As the music builds from a single voice to a chorus, soaring and lovely, most viewers find it hard to resist wishing that the offering in their church 
might embody the same spirit of profound joy and deep gratitude. This is the time for our offering. You are invited to give to Pilgrim Congregational Church using any of these methods. You can give online, select uh, from Give to Pilgrim, um, select Giving from the menu, or click the Give to Pilgrim button via the tithe.ly, that's T-I-T-H-E, and a period, and then L-Y app, downloaded from your phone's app store, or you can text the word give to 833-721-1098, or you can always mail a check-in. And now we dedicate our gifts and our lives. We offer these gifts, O oh God, of all people, in the hope and trust that you will use them to bring healing and hope where there is need. Thank you, God, for the privilege of this offering. May it do more than we can even imagine. Amen. As is our custom on Communion Sundays, we will not have a formal time for prayers of the people. However, during our Communion Liturgy, you will have a time when you will be invited to lift up your joys and concerns, either in your heart or out loud, or you are invited to type them into the chat, just being aware that prayers typed into the chat are publicly available. If you'd like to make a more private prayer request, you can either do so on our website or contact a deacon for healing prayer via phone. As we prepare to celebrate the Lord's Supper, I invite you to look at the elements before you, the bread, the juice, or whatever beverage you have prepared. There's probably nothing at all that special about them, but there is beauty in the ordinary because the work of the Spirit makes the ordinary holy. As we break bread from wherever we are, Christ invites our ordinary selves with our ordinary bread. We bear witness to something we imagine from our sanctuary, but we cannot see the expansive, far-reaching table of God. Sisters and brothers in Christ, your table may look like your kitchen table, your coffee table, your very own lap, but it is an extension of the Lord's great banquet. Let us share in the feast that Christ has provided. Please pray with me and let us give thanks to our God. While we long to return to normal, to just be together, God, tasting the same bread, sharing the same cup, we cannot deny that there is still and is always reason to bring our thanks and praise to you. It is truly right and good and joyful to give you thanks, dear God, source of life and fountain of mercy. You have filled us and all creation with your blessings and fed us with your constant love. You have redeemed us in Jesus Christ and knit us into one body. Through your spirit, you replenish us and call us to fullness of life. Thank you for today's visible reminder that no building can contain the promises of your reliable presence with us and for us. Remembering your constant faithfulness across the torment of all days, we give thanks for the signs of you, O God, with us 
in these ordinary gifts of bread and juice. Pour out your spirit upon us wherever we may be and stir amidst these gifts of bread and cup that they may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your spirit, unite us at your table across the miles with one another, with your children in every time and place, with the living Christ. Amen. We recall the story of the Last Supper when Jesus and his friends were gathered around a table, perhaps like this. After they finished eating, Jesus took some bread. He prayed a prayer of thanks to God, and he broke the friends, the bread, and then he gave it to his friends saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this and remember me. After dinner was finished, he took a cup and once again giving thanks to God, he gave it to his friends saying, drink from this cup, all of you. This is a sign of the new covenant between you and God. For God promises forgiveness for all your wrongdoings. Do this in remembrance of me. Gracious God, we ask you to bless this bread and cup and all of us with the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. Through this meal, make us the body of Christ, the church, your servant people, that we may be salt and light and leaven for the furtherance of your will in the world. Lord, hear us now as we pray in the quiet of our homes or our hearts, wherever we may be. We lift up our joys and concerns for those that are on our hearts. Today, I also ask a special prayer of comfort and grace for Sylvia and her family who are grieving the sudden death of her brother. And now with one voice, we lift up our prayers to you, the great one God who embraces our differences, yet rejoices in our unity in this one communion act. Let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us in the words most familiar to each of us. Our creator who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, my friends, I invite you to take a, bread, a piece of your bread and a sip from your cup and to taste the mystery of God's grace. The body of Christ broken for you, the blood of the new covenant. body of Christ broken for you and the love of the new covenant.
Let us pray. Holy God, even when all of this is over, may we not forget how you held us together while we were apart, how you built a table across the miles, how you call us to continue the work of table building. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I have several announcements to share with you on this July 4th Sunday. We hope to see many of you this evening at our annual Do-It-Yourself 4th of July picnic. Despite the fact that there will not be fireworks in Oak Park this year, we will gather on the front lawn of Pilgrim, and we invite you to bring your own chairs, blankets, and picnic supper. As a safety precaution, please don't bring food or beverages to share. However, you are very welcome to bring your favorite lawn game, like bocce ball, cornhole, etc. The Pilgrim office will be closed on Monday, July 5th in observance of Independence Day. And starting this Friday, July 9th, I want to call your attention to a wonderful new opportunity to join other pilgrims for inclusive yoga on Fridays. They'll meet from 4 to 5 here in the Pilgrim Parlor. The class will be led by Kathy Ward, who is a certified yoga instructor, and there is no charge but registration is required. Uh, simply call or email the church office. More information is available on our website. Also, I want to let you know that it is not too late to register for General Synod as a visitor. The cost is $100 and it runs July 11th through 18th. There are many great workshops, wonderful worship opportunities, uh, as well as the opportunity to learn more about our denomination and our stand on key timely issues such as condemning conversion therapy, eliminating cash bail, and racism as a public health crisis. General Synod is virtual this year, so you can join on Zoom. You can go to ucc.org to get more information on how to register. And most, if not all, of the work sessions and worships will be held in the evening so that you'll be able to participate uh, if you are working during the day. I'm also very, very excited to invite all of you to join us next Sunday, July 11th at 10 a.m. for our first in-person worship here in our sanctuary in over a year. Masks for those who are not fully vaccinated are required and social distancing will be encouraged. Live streaming will also be available for those who are not comfortable attending in person and there will not be a formal fellowship hour next Sunday, either in person or virtually. The following week on Sunday, July 18th, we will have our annual church planning meeting via Zoom from 1 to 3 p.m. All of you are invited to join us. And now that the state of Illinois has moved to phase five and our congregation is willing to get together in person again, there are lots of things for us to plan for. We need your ideas and your input. So we hope that you will join us again. Uh, it's July 18th from one to three and the Zoom link can be found on our website. And now for a celebration we have been waiting for for a year. Please be sure to mark your calendars to celebrate Pastor Colin Knapp's ordination on Sunday, July 25th at 4 p.m. The service was delayed as so many things were due to COVID, but now all is ready. Everyone is welcome and encouraged to attend Pastor Collins' ordination service, which will be at Northfield Community Church. That is at 400 Wagner Road, Northfield, Illinois. Again, it will be in person July 25th at 4 p.m. We will be having virtual fellowship time today following the service, and we hope that you'll also join Pastor Colin and Bobby Hald for virtual evening prayer service on Tuesday evening. The Zoom links for both events can be found on our website. And now please join us in singing our closing hymn, O oh, for a World, stanzas one, four, and five. Oh, for a world where 
everyone raised as each other's ways. Where love is lived and all is done with justice and with grace. The poor are rich, the weak are strong, the foolish ones are wise. Tell all who mourn, now cast me on, who perishes will rise. All for a world preparing for the glorious reign of peace, where time and tears will be no more, and all but love blessing with you as we close our worship time today. May you see the face of God in everyone you meet, and my everyone you meet see the face of God reflected in you. Go in peace. <laughs>